So how did I cope? You know, I just buried myself in my job as a physician. I took on more responsibilities at work and I did a lot of call duties all to get away. I was running away from the emotional pain at home. And I buried myself in my job, helping other people, healing other people while my home was was on fire. Mm. So, yeah. So we had this verbal, uh, you know, fight. And my husband would say to me, don't talk to me like my like a, like like I'm your nine year old son, and you say until you start respecting me, you're never going to get affection from me. You know you're never going to get what you want from me. Welcome to the Empowered Wife Podcast, where it's all about fixing your marriage without your man's conscious effort, so that you feel desired, taken care of, and special even if your relationship feels hopeless. I'm Laura Doyle, and today I'm talking about three simple fixes if your husband speaks to you disrespectfully. My guest, Dr. K, and her husband were separated on different continents. Since she was the breadwinner and they had a lot of disagreements about parenting, there wasn't much left to hold on to. But then Dr. K had some insights and changed how she showed up with her husband. And today her marriage is peaceful and she has a tender husband who takes on responsibilities for their family like never before. She's going to tell us how she did it so you can do it too. But first, let's talk about three simple fixes if your husband speaks to you disrespectfully, which feels really hurtful and embarrassing, especially if someone else hears it, even if it's just your kids. I mean, that's not the role modeling you want them to have. If he's yelling, swearing, calling you names, or telling you you're crazy or stupid or worse, well, you shouldn't have to live with feeling demeaned like that by the guy who's supposed to love and protect you. It's stressful and bad for your self-esteem. So let's get you back to feeling safe and adored when your husband speaks to you with these three simple fixes. Number one, check your side of the street. Since he's the disrespectful one, you've probably told him he needs to be more respectful, which hasn't worked. I know this because I tried the same thing. It didn't work for me either. But what did improve everything at my house, but took a lot more courage and humility, was when I finally said, I apologize for being disrespectful. I apologize for being disrespectful when I said you should read the manual for the new video camera. You see, my husband, John, is a videographer, so that was pretty disrespectful on my part. So were a lot of the other things I said, thinking that I was just being helpful, which gave him the impression that I didn't think he was competent, which was accurate. I thought I was very competent, and if he was doing things a different way, well, he should learn to do them my way. I didn't even realize that was disrespectful, but it was. When I started apologizing for my disrespect, I still thought he was at least 99% of the problem. So I was apologizing for just my 1% of the disrespect at our house. But when I did that, I started to become more sensitive to all the times I was disrespectful, which was way more than 1% of the time. Getting out the broom and sweeping just my side of the street resulted in our conversations being more respectful on both sides. It also inspired him to clean up his side of the street. So I had a lot more power than I realized. Number two, say ouch. Once you find the courage to become more respectful, you can experiment with saying ouch when your husband speaks to you disrespectfully. It's vulnerable and it can be pretty scary to say, and it can take a little practice to remember to say it, but it's worth it because... You can teach people how to treat you better, and you can also stay with yourself in a moment when you feel hurt. I love this cheat phrase for becoming vulnerable when I'm tempted to be defensive, which just never got me anywhere I want to go in my relationship. Number three, use a spouse-fulfilling prophecy. On last week's podcast, we talked about how you can find your desires by thinking of a complaint and then just flipping it upside down, right? So if the complaint is that you're so tired, 
the desire might be that you want to sleep in tomorrow. Or if the complaint is that you never get to do anything fun, the desire might be that you want to go on a girl's weekend with your friends. It's pretty simple, right? You just take the complaint and flip it upside down to get the desire, including the complaint that your husband speaks to you disrespectfully, right? That's a complaint. Now think with me here about what your desire is. Maybe it's that he speaks to you so sweetly or that he's such a gentleman or he's so considerate or that he's always sensitive to your feelings. I'm just making these up. You might have a different desire. You might have a better one. Maybe your desire is that he's just always so respectful or polite, or maybe it's that you always feel so safe with him. That was mine. And I can honestly say I do feel so safe with my husband now. And I want to show you how you can have the same thing. Once you have your desire about how you want to be treated, you can make that into this spouse fulfilling prophecy. And the way I do that is I write down the experience I want to be having as if I'm already having it and saying it to him or thanking him for it. As in, I always feel so safe with you or Thank you for always making me feel so safe. That's the first part of making a spouse fulfilling prophecy. Next, I start gathering evidence that my spouse fulfilling prophecy is actually true. Like if he says, I didn't want to yell from across the house. Well, that's evidence he doesn't like to yell, which could be construed as him making me feel safe. Or if he says, don't worry, it's going to be okay. I could even say to him, Thank you for always making me feel safe. I gather evidence wherever I can and I collect it greedily in one place so I can review it frequently and affirm to him that that's the experience I'm actually having with him, which has been a powerful tool for creating a much different and much better experience than focusing on what I don't want to experience. At first, you're going to think, well, there is no evidence for my spouse fulfilling prophecy. But to experiment with this is powerful. You're going to open your eyes a little wider and look for the evidence that you would give to a judge and jury about how your husband makes you feel so safe or whatever experience you're wanting to have instead of feeling he speaks to you disrespectfully. Which of these three simple fixes are you going to experiment with first to make your home more respectful? I have exciting news for you because right now you can listen to my book, The Empowered Wife, for free with your Audible membership in the United States. So discover the six surprising secrets to attract your man's time, his attention, his affection when you listen to The Empowered Wife audiobook on Audible without using credits. You don't need any credits. It's free. The Empowered Wife has over 1,700 five-star reviews, and it also has some one-star reviews too, because not everybody is ready to hear what they can do to fix their relationship without their man even knowing about it. And I get it. I wasn't ready either until my marriage was completely falling apart and we were on the brink of divorce. And then I learned from women with happy marriages what actually works. And now my marriage is shiny and amazing. And those secrets are in this book. And you can listen to the whole book for free with your Audible membership. The only catch is that this Audible deal is only for a limited time. So to make your marriage last and thrive, go and listen for free with your Audible membership right now. My guest, Dr. K and her husband were separated on different continents. And since she was the breadwinner and they had a lot of disagreements about parenting, there wasn't much left to hold on to. But then Dr. K had some insights and changed the way she showed up with her husband. And today... Her marriage is peaceful and she has a tender husband who takes on responsibilities for their family like never before. She's going to tell us how she did it so you can do it too. Dr. K, welcome to the Empowered Wife podcast. I'm so excited to have you here today. Oh, thank you, Laura. (laughs) So take us back to the old days, the bad old days in your marriage. What was going on? Okay, so uh, so I, I'd like to introduce myself properly, the way I like to introduce myself to people. So I say I'm Dr. K. I'm a wife, a mother, uh, a board-certified pediatrician in the United States, and most importantly, 
I'm a you know a woman that's grounded in my faith in uh, re- relationship with Jesus Christ, and um, so the story of my journey, my marital journey, began quite in my early in my twenties. Uh, I met my husband at church. Um, we were campus students then, and I remember this evening when he walked into our Bible study group. Our leader for the Bible study wasn't around, and he came to substitute. So this young man, well-dressed, stepped into this room with a swag and a presence. <laughs> and he was so knowledgeable the way he spoke. He, he, he commanded so much uh, respect. And I just like, wow, I love this guy. He fit the kind of person I've had in my childhood dreams, you know. And so um, that was my first uh, introduction, our first time we met. And so we became friends and uh, he liked me so much. He would call he um i was in medical school then so he would call he would write he was in a school that was about eight hours away he would write and whenever he came to town he would come to see me um he would write me poems it was such a good poet and love letters and i have all the stacks of love letters still today and so he went out of his way to give me gifts introduce me to his friends to his family everybody knew us together and i remember what made up my mind that this was the guy that I wanted to spend the rest of my life with. So we um, we had a, a, a party at the beach one of these Saturdays and all the campus students came. So while we're there having fun, suddenly one of the girls in our group started drowning in the Atlantic Ocean where we were. And in a split of a second, my, boy, my boyfriend then just ran into the water and rescued her. I was like, you know, it was so amazing to me and um i was like wow this he could yeah he's this selfless you know and another incident (laughs) yeah yeah, another incident happened where we were at a restaurant near his family home and and while we were there uh we're on a date suddenly there were gunshots outside the restaurant and arm robbers were in the area it was so close so everybody docked under the table we're all scared but amazingly, what he did was he put his body over me to cover me as a shield so that if anybody came in, he was going to, it's like, it was basically take, going to take the bullet for me. I was like, whoa, this is the best guy for me. And so um, I think two years after I was doing medical school, we got married. And that was where the problem started. <laughs> I would say that I had the three big C's, the, the the complaints, the criticism, and in comparison. That was what was going on with me. Now, my thinking was that we were great friends. You know, we've been together for this long, and I should be able to say what about was on my mind. And I should be able to tell him how I felt. And I had no filters. I just said everything the way I felt. And um, I didn't realize how this was landing on my husband. I have this belief that, you know, we're modern people, we're good educated, so we should share the chores in the house 50-50 um, and that we should deliberate on our decisions together. And even wear a shoebi, this is a Nigerian outfit that couples wear that look alike, and, you know, to show our unity as husband and wife. And my husband would completely refuse. And he would say to me, you don't know how to talk. I was like, what do you mean? Me? I'm a physician, I'm a debater in school, I will feel so hurt and I will, you know, fight back with words. Uh, so, so with my mindset, I also had this weight of uh, uh, cultural expectations of me as a wife. Um, you know, I, I have to be the cook, I cook in the house, I clean, I take care of the home, I entertain, I raise the children and I keep my job. Oof. I didn't know how to balance all of this. Uh, I feel day. tired. I feel tired just hearing <laughs> that list already. I, and I was so resentful, very resentful. And uh, I felt like I was giving the short end of the stick. You know, that whole my husband had to do was go to work, provide money for upkeep and just enjoy himself. So while I did most of the work and I did not know how to ask for help. So I complained a lot. Mm-hmm. And what made my life really hard was the long hours I worked as a physician, I saving other people and then coming back home to serve, to give. Oh, it was exhausting. And um, now I had help. Like we had what we call house helps where we had some other people come stay in the house and help you. My mother-in-law was also helpful. 
another thing about me was that I was also a perfectionist at heart. I was so disappointed with the way my marriage was that I wrote a seven page letter to the evangelist in our church <laughs> telling him about my disappointment in my marriage and that marriage wasn't what I thought it was, you know, thought out to be. And I really believe that it was my husband's job to make me happy since I was such a great wife. Now, my church system then had this uh, 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 program, I'll call it a program where they, they match you with an older couple to mentor you. And so every week we met and like, how are you guys doing? I went to these sessions to complain all the time, you know, and we would have lead the sessions in Cold War. And um, I was confused as to why my husband wasn't changing since he was the problem. And I, I could see that he was a problem. <laughs> So, Laura, in your parlance, I was living on his paper. I just practically scammed on his paper because I had this belief that I am his helper, which translates into I should help him be a better person, you yeah. know? Yeah. Because <laughs> so, it's just going to help him improve, be a better husband, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So, our relationship was just topsy toby for several years. There were good times and uh, not so good times. What I, what I just did was, you know, it was expected of me. So I just trudged along with this mindset that, well, this is what marriage is. I, I just have to do the hard work, just like everything in life. Just go along with it. So I grit my teeth and just went on with it. Mm. And this is, That's sad, right? This is yeah. very discouraging to just yeah. say, this yeah. is it. This, is, this sucks, but this is how I'm going to live. Yeah. Yeah. And, and then when our children were born, the conflicts increased because now we had to do, talk about parenting styles. He wanted to parent this way and I wanted to parent a different way and how to manage our finances, how much to contribute to our relatives or to charity. It was just a lot. It was one thing after the other. That was that was always happening. Now, there were good times, but I can really remember the hard times. It felt really hard. So I have to give my husband the credit that despite all our marital challenges, he still wanted to please me. And I did express the desire that I wanted to uh, study in America. I wanted to come and train to be a pediatrician here. And he did everything he could to get me to come to the United States to train as a pediatrician. He supported me and the kids while I was preparing for the USML, the college US, US medical licensing exam. And even while I was uh, um, in residency training, he did all that. He supported me while he was there. He would change uh, currency to dollars. And he, he was so supportive, along with my family too. And I'll tell you, Laura, it was an arduous journey, very challenging. I, I don't know how I made it, but I did. So I became a board certified pediatrician. I finished my, <laughs> my training with a lot of tears along the way. And my husband, you know, would go back and forth because he had, you know, started, he started his own business. He was an entrepreneur. And so he would go back and forth and, and, and come be with us when he could come. But he um, met our needs the best way he could during this time. And um, so after I graduated, I got my first job. And my desire was that my family, we should live under one roof. So what he did was he left the business and moved over to come live with us. So we began to live together as a family under one roof. Now the children were in school and were living comfortably on my income while my husband was settling into the system to establish himself. But this time the conflict was different same but different in a different way in that now <laughs> the attended challenges of settling in this new culture uh blending our lives together after time apart and then i'd also become an expert on parenting i'd become an expert in managing finances and i just took everything over in that helpful state again and um it was exhausting <laughs> And so my husband couldn't do anything right because I knew better. I would counter whatever he tells me. Oh, no, this is what we do here. Not how you did it back home, you know. So <laughs> um, it was hard. And it was harder because the buffer system that I had where I had babysitter wasn't there. So no babysitter, no mother-in-law. So all of this were on my plate. Oh, 
<laughs> oh. oh my goodness, it was hard, Laura. Uh, oh, so the basketball hard. runs, the the parent teacher meetings, uh, it was hard. Um, <laughs> I um uh, I noticed that my husband wanted to help, and now when I look back, because of your book, I could see the areas that he wanted to help, but I didn't let him because I was the expert. Then I noticed that he began to slowly withdraw emotionally and then physically. Um, I felt like I was carrying all the burden alone that we were just roommates. That was what it felt like. And then we fought all the time because I would complain about my life. I will complain about him. He would become defensive. So it was, a, it was like a dance, you know? And I walked around a lot on eggshells, feeling frustrated, angry, resentful, and bitter. And I began telling myself negative stories. You know, what you call spouse fulfilling prophecies? Mm -hmm. I'll say, my husband doesn't love me. My husband is a freeloader. You know, very derogatory terms in my mind. You know, I remember saying it aloud one day to a friend, and this caused my husband and I to have a big fight. He was so angry, you know. I had forgotten where we were coming from, how he supported me. So how did I cope? You know, I just buried myself in my job as a physician. I took on more responsibilities at work and I did a lot of call duties all to get away. I was running away from the emotional pain at home and I buried myself in my job, helping other people, healing other people while my home was, was on fire. Mm. So, yeah. So we have this devil, uh, you know, fight, and my husband would say to me, don't talk to me like my, like, a, like, like I'm your nine year old son. And he would say, until you start respecting me, you're never going to get affection from me. You know, you're never going to get what you want from me. He said that? Like yeah, he, he said those things to me. Now, I didn't understand. Now, through your skill, I'm realizing that those are valuable information from him. But I didn't know what to do with them, you know? No. No, what does that even mean, right? First of all, how are you disrespectful? Mean, right? And second of all, like, why can't he just be affectionate? He should just be affectionate anyway, <laughs> right? Then right? you are respectful, you probably thought. Yeah. yeah. Thought. You're working and, so hard. And, and, yeah. And home wasn't a, a happy place for our kids. And they began acting out. And I remember our oldest daughter sleeping with the house phone at night, you know, um, because she was scared of the verbal fights. And Here's me advising families at work how to manage your children, providing support for them. And here was my family falling apart. And what made the situation worse was that I was sharing about my pain with my children. And it wasn't helping their relationship with their dad. So I was already, you know, creating a divide. And I thought I was doing the right thing. I was a good parent. He was a bad one. Yeah, the tension in our home was palpable. And I tell you, Laura, I read a lot of marriage books uh, that I could find. I attended marriage seminars. I got ad advice from friends about things I could try out. And I even traveled distances to learn. There was this program I heard about nonviolent communication training. I did that. I did love and respect program. Nothing was working. <laughs> now, I knew that the Bible said that you have to respect your husband. But, and then there was a program that teach that respect is like oxygen to men. But in my mind, I'm like, what does it look like? I, I think I'm being respectful, but it's not working. Um, so no one taught me what it means to be respectful. And um, I, it was a model for me at home. Um, what I did know, what I did know was that my husband wasn't loving me the way I wanted to be loved. So I needed to do something about it. So I was in a conundrum, and, you know, trying to find answers, you know, and I did not want to live my rest of my life this way. Something had to give, and it was too painful to be stuck in this place. So by the sixth year in the United States, I was at breaking point. And like it was, that's it. And I asked my husband for separation. Mm -hmm. That's after we had been to counseling for a year, because I always advise people, go to counseling, they will help you, you know. I thought the counselor would help me fix him. <laughs> yeah. It was my last resort. And Laura, it was hard. Mm -hmm. um, I was not getting the help that I deserved. And he was not pulling me his weight in our home. And as I told I should. So my husband told me he didn't want a separation. He said, 
that separation was equal to divorce. He said, you know, that we could solve our marital problems by ourselves. He said, come the, the ball is in your court. <laughs> if you change, everything will change. Oh my God, his statement would get me so furious. And I would rage at him. I was a rager too, I'll tell you that. So I was so hurt and angry and thought that my life, life was unfair. And what made me even mad, even like really crazy was when he would read me these proverbs. He would say, a wise woman builds a house, <laughs> but we are on and the foolish one tears it down. Like, oh. yeah. <laughs> so Laura, it's this, not me. You're the one that's wrecking everything. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, this was what was going on. And then we hit rock bottom after a very particularly bad quarrel. I asked him to leave. And um, right after that time, he got a job abroad and he left in anger, telling me that he was never coming back. Oh. And that was when COVID 19 hit. Oh. Yeah. Oh, oh Dr. K. This is rough. All right. So you're separated. You, you've you done all the things. You read the marriage books. You went to counseling. You had the mentors at church. You, you've you done everything you know to do to try to fix this marriage. And and now, and it was too painful. And so now you've asked for a separation and, and then he leaves and gets a job abroad. You're still in the United States. So what happened? Did I mean, were things better in a way? No, 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 it wasn't better. It was after he left, I just gained clarity that that is not what I want. I want my husband at home. And um, I did not know how to live together peacefully with him. That was the problem. So it was, was, part, of you, yeah. was part of you thinking when you asked for a separation, like this will really make him straighten up now yeah that was that was, that was what the, that was what the counselor said she said if they if you shock them with this that they was you know buckle up and do get right. the message yeah don't get the okay. message yeah yeah and it didn't work so it didn't work so it was after this time i really got clarity i'm like that's not what i wanted it was so painful and i remember this day uh i like crying every night and you know trying to call him he wouldn't respond I went to the library, my library, and I saw this book on my shelf, The Empowered Wife. Now, interestingly, a friend of me, a friend of mine had introduced me to the book the year we were going to counseling. I read the book, the first page. I was so mad. I was like, this woman doesn't know what she's talking about, and I threw it away. <laughs> but this time around, I saw the book again. It said The Empowered Wife. So I said, well, let me look at it. And this tells me, you know, this saying that it said, when the student is really ready, right, that the teacher appears. So that's what happened to me. Mm. And the interesting thing was the promise of your program, how to fix your marriage relationship without your husband's conscious effort spoke to me. In my mind, I thought that as long as the method this woman is using is not witchcraft, I was willing <laughs> to do whatever it took to restore the peace in my marriage and to have my family back. So that was what happened. So I dove into the um, um, program and started reading the book. And then I found out like, oh my God, I can't do this alone. I, I don't, I read the book, I tried to do some, it was hard. So I said, you know, I need to get help. And then I looked at the book, they said you could, you know, get, I looked at your website and they said you could get a coach. I'm like, yeah, I'm gonna get a coach. And that was what I did. So, but this time you weren't mad. It sounds like you were, you felt some hope that. I felt some hope because you said you could change your relationship without your husband's conscious effort. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> because he's there. So I said, well, this is me. I'm going to work on it and see and prove if this book works. If what you say it works. Yeah. And then yeah. I'm get someone to help me. <laughs> just want to change him. Yeah. I, I love it. That was, <laughs> that's how I got started with the skills too. I just kind of changed this guy. <laughs> So, um, so what, what happened? What did you, did you start doing anything differently than you had been? Oh before? yeah. Oh yeah. What did Started you doing do? things differently. So, um, the beautiful thing was, um, I was introduced to the concept of self-care. Now my life and my profession is all about serving and giving up myself. And the truth is that my work defined my identity. I'm Dr. K and everyone 
knows me as that. Now, the truth is that aside from my work as a doctor, I didn't know who I was. I didn't know the real me. And uh, I had lost myself. So when I diligently, uh, you know, what I did was the, the lady, the coach who was paired up with me was also a doctor who understood me, understood where I was coming from. And she really helped me a lot because she had transformed our own marriage relationship that looked like my story. And I was like, oh, she could do it. It gave me hope, right? So I was ready. And so what I did was self-care was so, so key to fill me back up. I had three things I did every day. She told me to put three things in my schedule, just like a hair appointment, and I religiously followed that. So I'll wake up in the morning, I'll have my quiet time, I'll read my book, I'll journal, I'll write, how do I feel, what do I want? And I wrote that down every day, religiously. And I would listen to the podcast, the Empowered by podcast on my drive to work, on a commute to work. I'll listen to it when I'm going, I'll listen to it when I'm coming back, just inspired by these women, like, oh, wow. If she can do it, I can do it too. You know, that was what inspired me. And then 30 minutes at my break time, every day at work, I took a walk. I just go for a walk. It's it's so refreshing. So those were the three minimal things I did. And then I also started doing other things. As I wrote 20, uh, list of 20 things to do. Um, one of the things I did that I saw that really helped me was when I get home at night, because after giving all day, get home at night, I'm so exhausted. And I realized that that's the time I'm most angry and resentful and, you know, scream at the kids. So I took action. I decided I'll get 30 minutes of nap after work. So I told my family, I told my kids that. And they just let me be. So 30 minutes, I'll nap and then wake up and I'm good again. I'm able to. And in that time, interestingly, the kids started preparing dinner. So I didn't have to do that, you know. They started preparing dinner at that time before I woke up. Oh my um, gosh. So you yeah. got a nap and you didn't have to make dinner. I didn't have to make dinner, you know? And then I began experimenting with makeup. I didn't used to wear makeup. No. <laughs> you should see my before and after pictures. This is a different oh, movie, right? You uh, you look gorgeous. You look absolutely gorgeous. So yeah, I, it's hard for me to picture you without makeup. Yeah, I have to admit. I don't put on no. lipstick. <laughs> so I put on lipstick. Um I began arranging trips for myself and the kids. And sometimes I go along with friends just to have fun. And then one of the most amazing thing was I discovered dancing. I, I you know, this is this is interesting because as a kid I used to dance, but to go back to dancing again, you know, uh, as a kid dancing just takes you to this place of reckless abandon and 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 joy and this freedom, you know. So I went back to that place and it so fills me up. So whenever I'm in the dumps, I just have to put on the music and dance. <laughs> And I get back up again because I connect back to the, that little me. And one other thing I did was I just learned new dance steps. I watched YouTube videos. I'm like, okay, I'm going to do this one. Just experiment with different things. I and slowly, it. yeah, slowly and surely, I began to discover myself and the things that made me happy. I began to fall in love with me. <laughs> now, so <laughs> when you first started doing all these self-care things, which I love, by the way, I can... You, I mean, look at you, you had a big smile on your face. Just tell me about, <laughs> about that. So, and it is very appealing, but did you think like, how is this going to change my husband? Oh like, yeah. Okay. Yeah. That was I, the first, you know, the first time I picked up your book, right. And that was a path I read. That was, you know, I like, how is this going to change? No, I threw it away. Yeah. Right. But, this is not going to work. <laughs> this is not yeah, gonna yeah. work. Okay. But now when I saw a coach who was, who done my coach, who had done that and had transported a marriage and I said, okay. She's got something here. I got to do it. So okay. that was what helped me, put me in that mode to do it. Yeah. Yeah. She had the credentials that you she had the credentials. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. Love it. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, so you're dancing. You started to say, yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah. So, so I began to fall in love with myself and I had to start saying positive affirmations about me because I had a lot of negative thoughts about me, you know, and one of the major one was I used to tell myself, that you are worthy of love. I look at myself in the mirror and tell myself, like, you're worthy of love. And that is amazing. I, that self-care transformed my life. And it's still one of the bedrock of the things I do till this day. Yeah. So you would stand and look at the, in the mirror and just say, yeah. you are worthy of love. It kind of, it kind of makes me cry. It kind of makes <laughs> you cry. Like that's a tender message for yourself. It sounds like yeah. it um, really landed on your heart to hear yourself say that. Yes. Yeah. 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 And, and then the other thing that I did, 
um, the skill of respect was a big step that led me to restore the respect in my marriage. And I found out from your book how disrespectful I'd been as a wife to my husband. I didn't know what respect looked like or what it feels like to a man. <laughs> wow. I've heard it preached many times, right, yeah. that a wife must respect her husband. Yeah. Uh, but what does it look like, you know? Yeah, yeah. He probably thought, I am respect. What do you mean? I do. Right? I, I cook his food. I, yeah. I'm next to him. <laughs> I, bring home, I bring home a paycheck. Like, yeah. I make a lot of money. I, yeah. Right? I, yeah. All these things that have nothing yeah. to do with respect. Yeah. But yeah. So your book gave me practical examples that I could experiment with once I understood what it meant, you know, that, you know, the only thing you say is that respect is like oxygen to a man. And that signs that you're being disrespectful is when he withdraws from you. So I had to make this big apology. So I wrote him this really long email because, you know, we weren't talking much then. And I used the formula that you shared because in the past I used to say, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. You tell me sorry for yourself. So this time around I said, <laughs> I'm going to try Laura's formula. So I wrote, I apologize for being disrespectful when I asked you to leave our home, when I wrote the seven page letter, you know, uh, 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 you know, complaining about you, when I corrected you about how to parent our kids, when I told you what kind of job you should, I just wrote a lot. It was a lot, Laura. And all I could remember for the 19 years of our marriage before I found the skills so it was a one and done apology for my past behavior. My, 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 my mindset was, you know, focus on the future and to create the marriage that I wanted. And I couldn't undo the past. I had cried. I had felt miserable. I couldn't undo it. I felt really remorseful that mm -hmm. I had such a big part to play in the breakdown of my marriage. So I took responsibility and became, you know, accountable with that apology. And you know what? So I thought if I made that apology that to clean the slates and yeah. we'll come back, right? Right. It was crickets. Nothing. No Nothing. response. No response. A very challenging silence. Oh, my God. It was very disconcerting. Oh, and I thought, no, the skills are not working for me. And all the all the wives say when I apologize, he responded tenderly. What is going on? Oh, so unfair, right? Like, yeah, yeah. it must be must be that it really is your husband. Is that what you yeah. thought? Like, he's there's really something wrong yeah. with him. Yeah, I thought so. But um, gladly, I have my coach, and she coached me and redirected, you know, my thoughts to look at the wings, look at the little wings, right? Because. I started noticing that our conversations on the phone were getting warmer. As I learned not to bite the, our familiar baits, <laughs> the, the familiar baits, the things I get mad at that triggers me to want to fight him. Uh, I duct tape a lot. That is just not say anything, duct tape uh, during the conversations. And I, and I started using your cheat phrases. He says, I hear you, right? And whatever you think, to support my practice of being respectful, as I began to change the dance. Now, it's interesting that you use this cheat phrase because, you know, you don't, there's such ingrained patterns in your behavior that you have to grab onto something to, to hold on to as you begin to learn. And so these cheat phrases were what helped me. So I'll say, I hear you. I'll say, yeah, uh, whatever you think. So I'm just, just doing these things as I learned, I got deeper in the skill uh, the peace was restored in our phone conversations because we went from being acrimonious, mad, angry to being peaceful. And then that's so, big. That's yeah. Huge. Yeah. Yeah. So that was when I began to focus on my gains and not the gaps and expectations I had. Because if I looked at, you know, the gaps, like, oh, no, he didn't respond the way I wanted, you know, I'll feel like the skill is not working. But mm -hmm. when I look at the little things, I'm like, oh, my God. It's working. It's getting me closer to my vision. I have peaceful conversations now. We're not yelling on the phone. So all that made me uh, started to, I started choosing my focus wisely. And what do I mean by that? Because I can have evidence. I have all the evidence to show that the skill is not working. If I looked, yeah. I have it. Yeah. 
but I equally had the evidence to show that his skills were working. So I had to choose. And when I when I thought about my vision, my vision is to have my family live together peacefully on that one roof. So I had to choose my focus. So I choose those little wings. I choose to see the things that are happening, the evidence, and um, wow. and then trusting because there was a lot of faith involved in that. Trusting that. Yeah. It was part of you thinking like your coach is asking you to focus on your wins, and was part of you thinking like, oh come on, like. <laughs> That's that. I mean, that's that's small compared to that. He didn't even respond to my apology letter. Right. This is not as important. Like this is this is crazy. I, I thought that? I thought so. I thought so. But then I remember that this coach had been through this fact before. Yeah, that's true. That's true. OK. I, trust, I trusted her. OK. OK. Her. Like, if she got this outcome, then I'm going to get it. I just have to keep on doing what I needed oh to my- do. Gosh, so you just chose your faith. You just, yeah. even yeah. though it sounds like it was pretty uncomfortable. It was. Yeah. It was okay. Much. Okay. But you were committed. You were very so, committed. So. Yeah. So after eight months of practicing this skill single-handedly during my husband's absence for a moment, so I noticed the change in our conversation, you know, that we went from being resentful, angry, and, you know, to getting together peaceful. Um, now the third skill, I'll use three skills that helped me. The third skill that helped me was vulnerability. Now, this is the hard skill for me, and I'm still growing in that because as a child, I was trained to stuff things up, just grit my teeth and survive, right? (laughs) And my life as a physician, I had to put on this heart of, being invulnerable to protect myself because there's so much that we deal with, right? And I realized that I stuffed up all my emotions. When I stick, you know, stuff all my emotions up, it comes out sideways <laughs> and I'm not my best self. So this was a stretch to go against my ingrained habits and um, beliefs of how I should be. So it was a stretch. And but this skill got me my breakthrough. So I began to experiment with the skill with the help of my coach. It was very scary. I felt exposed and I was afraid of being rejected. Rejection was a big thing for me, um, you know, if I told my husband. But I decided to just go ahead anyway and experiment. I began to say I can't to things that would take me to that familiar place of resentment. You know, if he asks me to, you know, he, so, like something's happening with the kids and I share with him and he wants me to parent our kids, you know, uh, and it's not on my paper, I, I, I'll just say I can't. And he's like, why can't you do that? You're there. Like, no, I can't. It was hard. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. What, <laughs> so like, what's an then, example of, like, something he would want you to? He, okay, so our daughter, um, let me see, our daughter was about to go to college, and um, she, he, she wanted, she needed help, and uh we needed a strong man hand around to help us move her stuff to college. And he he said, uh, talk to my friend. Like, I should go talk to his friend to help out. I was like, I can't. Like, you can pick up, in my mind, he, you can pick up the phone and call your friend. Yeah. It was hard for me to say that because I wanted to be helpful. I wanted to help our daughter. But uh, I felt like I can't do that. He's your friend. You can pick up the phone and call him as well. Anyway, so that was one. that was one place I said I can't. It just felt like it, it felt too vulnerable to call the friend. It sounds like or too risky. It felt yeah. too risky and uncomfortable. I, I, yeah, and uncomfortable. And I wanted to. I didn't want to like. Yeah, I wanted to protect my family. Right, that you know, it was a big deal for me to call his friend because that's his close friend. He should just pick up this phone and call his friend. That was how I felt. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it took a lot of practice a lot of relinquishing control of my husband's responses because he would push back. So when I say I can't, he would push back. So the other one I did again was saying, I miss you. (laughs) I remember texting him, I miss you, telling him on the phone after our conversation. So either I got no response or I just hear, thank you. (laughs) So I just kept doing it. It was hard, but I did it anyway. So I had to let go of how he responded because this is true to me. I do miss him. So during one of our conversations, just before Christmas that year, 
I told him that I miss him. And I said to him that my best Christmas gift ever would be to celebrate Christmas with my family under one roof. I just said that. It was just, it was on my heart. That's what I wished for. Yeah. I got no response and I, I was used to it anyway. So I just really pitch control and went about making my plans for the for the pre holiday season. <clears throat> but to my greatest surprise, Laura, <laughs> my husband showed up home, showed up back home that Christmas. Oh on my an gosh. <laughs> Unannounced. <laughs> Unannounced. Unannounced. He just showed up at home. I was shocked to my boots. Uh, <clears throat> and he told me that he was only going to stay for a month because of his job. He ended up staying for three months. Oh, before. my gosh. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> yeah. Dr. K. Oh, <laughs> you must have felt on top of the world. I was. I felt on top of the world. I felt overwhelmed with happiness that I had changed the dance. I did. Yeah. I trusted him back home without his conscious effort, like your book said. Yeah. <laughs> and it wasn't with witchcraft or voodoo. It, it was. wasn't. It wasn't voodoo. <laughs> he didn't read any books. He didn't, any book. No. I, I didn't tell him how to be. You know. I didn't criticize it. No. He didn't have to do anything. Just as, because I changed. I was becoming my best self. He began to change. Unbelievable. Yeah. So, so maybe that apology, even though he didn't respond, right? You were laying the groundwork for creating all this emotional safety that had him want to surprise you. So, yeah. Yeah. Sweet. Amazing. Yeah. So, then what happened? <laughs> so, yeah. So, the atmosphere in our home is lighter now. So no more walking around on eggshells. It is peaceful around here. We are connecting better as I practice the skills. And while he was home that three months, he began helping around the house. He was cooking for us <laughs> and cleaning the house without my prompting on his own. What? Right? Yeah. I'm telling you, this is amazing. And, you know, we also started parenting our daughters better because I allowed him to parent them the way he wanted. I didn't want, I didn't criticize anymore, telling or comment on anything. And amazingly, he would come to seek input from me. Like, you know, your woman, what, what, what do you think about this thing? You oh know? my gosh. <laughs> oh my gosh. Instead of you telling him yeah. he was, at, he was, accepting your influence and he was soliciting your influence. Yeah, he was soliciting my input. And and I also began to see, you know, because our daughters are now college age, they added it towards and began to change because when they come to me, I just send them back, you know, to him, like go ask your dad. And our relationship is closer now with my daughter and my husband. They interact their own way and with me, they feel so safe that they can come and share anything with and everything with me. But I think the most amazing part of the change for me was my mindset about finances. Now, instead of thinking my own money, because that was my mindset, my thinking is that now this is our family's wealth. And we're working through to build our family's financial fortune together because my husband is working now. I mean, he's always worked um, and my ultimate this goal is to relinquish everything to him because he's such a great manager himself. He, he owns a very successful business and he's doing really well. And uh, so this is the journey I'm working on, just letting go. But my mindset is what has completely changed, that I'm not like, this is my money. I do everything yet because I see now that he's, he's contributing to paying our bills. He's supporting my financial decision. So that, that's huge. That was huge. That is so those are the changes, you know, uh, in our relationship. Now, my husband still works abroad, and we we have this period apart. So this physical distance that we have could potentially create problems in our marriage, you know. But with the yeah. skills I've chosen to see this as a season in our life together that we unfold, like just like. Winter is rolling into beautiful, you know, season of spring. That is just a, a period in our life. And so the six intimacy skills is helping me to handle the season of our life with grace, you know. And I I I I I tell you, it gets lonely sometimes. Yeah. And misunderstanding of our reason 
uh, whatever, you know, I have decided to remain dignified in my response. I stay respectful and I have relinquished control of his journey. You know, I have all the evidence that he loves me. I have all the evidence that he wants my marriage. We're still married. And I tell you, sometimes I go into needless emotional turmoil. Like I get these worries and all that because I dearly want my husband to be home with me like yesterday, you know, but that's not where we are right now. My vision and my desire is that my family and I will live under one roof and I see that coming, you know, and I am so grateful to you and the community of coaches who are standing for me and my marriage, encouraging me to grow deeper in the skills as I continue to practice the skills, as I continue to help other women as well, because paying it forward, I see that paying it forward is also helping me stay in the skills. And um, my desire is to join you to end the world divorce. <laughs> and uh, so these are the things that are happening, but on a professional level for me, Oh my God, this has changed a lot of things, right? So the way I relate with my physician colleagues is so different. Uh, yeah, I, I see them being even more attracted to me. My staff at work, we are so close needed together because of my way of being, because of the skills. Even my patients and their parents, like I used to have problem with the parents, but now I can, you know, with the skills I learned from you, I can relate with them better. I'm a better listener. And guess what? My evaluations that we get every month have gone up. Like, you know, where I used to have low scores, now they're giving me very good scores. She's a good listener. She's a good pediatrician. Uh... <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, it's helped me a lot. And so it's, 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 it's like I practice the skills everywhere, even handling leadership positions that I have in my hospital and in my professional association. And so I see this skill so relevant, right? That is useful in all relationships. And I tell my colleagues that the, the intimacy skills are like the tools that we use for first aid to save lives. So we use first aid to the tools of first aid to save lives. The intimacy skills are the tools we need to save and heal broken relationships. So that's what it is for me. That's how I see it in my head and it's working and it's uh -huh. working. So it's really changed the way you show up at work so much. You probably didn't see that coming when you started working on your marriage. You didn't think, well, what I really need is to start listening more at work, right? But that's that's a like a fringe benefit that came out yeah. of yeah. Um, all the changes that you've made. <clears throat> so so here you've really changed, and then and your husband, I mean, he was always that heroic guy with swagger and. <laughs> protector right so he's kind of gone back to being the man you fell in love with yes yeah. yeah the amazing thing is all my mindset it was just my mindset <sighs> i needed to change and this is what this is what the skills did for me and your the the six intimacies are practical they're so practical that's what is different a lot of the books i read were te theoretical and mainly from a man's perspective, a lot of guys that wrote those books. <laughs> so this one was different and this changed my life, changed my life for good. Wow. Well, it's this is incredibly inspiring because I really hear how it, it, it was very discouraging at, at various points, right? Like writing that, that long apology and getting nothing, nothing yeah. back, right? Um, and um, yeah, yeah, I mean, there, there, this took tremendous commitment and uh, and determination too. So I, I'm very inspired by all that you did to to save your marriage. What do you think you would say to somebody who is where you were, where they're separated and um, they're still fighting over the kids, and um, but she realizes it's not what she wants. She wants she wants her husband back. She wants him to surprise her and stay for three months and then help with the cooking and uh you know uh demonstrate that he loves her what's your what's your best tip for her what should she do just tell her to go get the book <laughs> get the book and get a coach now i don't know that there are some people who read the book but the thing is if you want quicker action and faster uh results get a coach because even in my career as a physician, 
if you want to increase your efficiency and your output, you get a coach to help you look at your blind spots and tell you this is where you are, this is where you need to go. So that's what I'll tell her. Go get a coach. Go get a coach. <laughs> and it really, and that, that's clear in your story too, like without the coach who had been down this road before standing for you, it would have been pretty hard to not get discouraged yourself, it sounds like. Yeah. Do you know, yeah. the thing is, the thing is I, I just feel like a lot of people like me who are highly skilled, like we feel like we can do things. I mean, I can do things, but yeah, I can do everything. I realize <laughs> that now. <laughs> yeah. You know, I get it, Dr. K. Like you obviously were a good student, right? You made it all the way through medical school. Yeah. And it was very arduous. So uh, yeah, there's something about feeling like, um, I've always like I've been successful at work, so obviously I can do this with my marriage. But yeah. it's a different skill set in a way. It's a different skill set. Like so, when I when when I'm at work, I wear my professional hat. When I get home, I take out that and just wear my soft feminine hat and to to be the woman that I want to be loved, I want to be cherished, I want to be adored. So yeah, that has worked so well for me. Yeah, beautiful. Well, if you could go back in time and tell Dr. K what you know now about everything, yeah. <laughs> what do you think you would say to her? So I'll say, just relax and cool down, okay? Um, you chose and married a good man and your marital challenges are specially designed by God for you to expose you to yourself. <laughs> And to serve as a stage to transform you into the best version of you. And I'll tell her that you're not alone and that God has got you. You've got this and you have not failed. You have not failed. Because that was one thing that was so big for me. I'm like, oh my God, I, I've succeeded in other areas of my life. I can't fail in this world. I have to do it. So I'll tell her that you have not failed. You're just on a journey. It's going to get better. Specifically de designed by God. Say it again, for you to see yourself. Is that how you said it? Yeah, to expose you to yourself. Expose you to yourself. Wow. And to serve as a stage to transform you into the best version of you. Wow. I mean, uh, I really uh, relate to that too. I feel the same way. Like this, I would have never gone on this journey if I hadn't had the challenges in my marriage. And, uh, and I'm so glad I did. And it sounds like you are too. Yeah. Um, so it's very inspiring, Dr. K., Congratulations. I, I want to present you with my best wife award because you you fixed your family, right? Your daughters, you, your husband, all these lives have been changed through your determination and um, inc incredible commitment. And it's very inspiring to hear what's possible. And uh, and you did it. So um, you, you have ended world divorce in the most important way, starting with your own marriage. Uh, so congratulations. Oh, thank you, Laura. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, this has uh, been very uplifting, and uh, I'm so glad we got to hear your whole story. Uh, you're incredible. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you, Dr. K. You're welcome. Thank you so much. According to a study at Harvard, and this was horrifying to hear, if you know a couple who's getting divorced, you are 75% more likely to get divorced too. Woo! It matters who you listen to, which is why over 7,000 women like you who think that having a great marriage is important have joined our free Adored Wife group. The Adored Wife Group is a launch pad where you can meet our certified coaches and discover the best next steps for making your marriage last and thrive. It's 100% free to join. Just go to lauradoyle.org slash group right now. This is a private group and it's not for everybody, but if you are a wife or girlfriend who thinks that having a great marriage is important too, we'd all really like to meet you. So go to lauradoyle.org slash group right now to join us free. That's lauradoyle.org slash group. Listen and subscribe to the Empowered Wife podcast. On next week's podcast, I'm talking about two ways to deal with a partner who is not affectionate. We're going to fix that up. In the meantime, I hope you're having lots of fun. Today's fun fact is that I have a lot I want to get done today, but first I'm just going to watch just one of those shorts on a social media, just real quick. <laughs> 